My name is Megan DeDios and I serve the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry as Director of Continuing Education. It's great to have you all here for our fourth lecture in our Spring 2023 Continuing Education Lecture Series. Thank you for joining us on this webinar. As part of the school's mission, we offer an array of enrichment opportunities to foster Christian faith and to promote lifelong learning. We do this with webinars like this one, as well as online courses, on-campus presentations, videos, and other resources for personal enrichment and professional development. Our next course starts on March 22nd. This course is The Church, People of God on a Mission. This course reflects the church's teaching role, sacramentality, differences of culture, and the tension between the church's transcendent nature and its engagement with the human world. More information on this course and our remaining courses for this semester is available by visiting bc.edu slash crossroads. Don't miss your opportunity to enroll. We have several upcoming lectures and I would like to briefly highlight the next two. Next Thursday, March 16th, please join us virtually or in person for Mercy in the Old Testament, the Fruit of the Womb. In this lecture, STM's own Dr. Andrew R. Davis discusses in detail the sometimes overlooked contribution of the Old Testament to a Christian understanding of mercy. And on Saturday, April 1st, please join us for a special event. Fordham University's Professor Christine Fire Hinsey will offer this year's Underhill Lecture, Rest Vital Place in Spirituality and the Work of Justice. This free in-person only lecture will be held on the Boston College main campus in Gaston Hall starting at 10 a.m. And STM alumni, please join us for a pre-lecture reception starting at 9 a.m. Meet our new STM Dean, Father Michael McCarthy, and our new STM faculty members. Mingle with some of your favorite former professors and catch up with fellow alumni. It will be a wonderful, exciting morning. We hope you can all join us in person. More information on all of our upcoming opportunities will be included in the follow up email. We hope you can join us for a future event or to enroll in the course. Thanks to Dr. Costello and Dr. Zacharias for both granting us permission to record tonight's presentation, including the question and answer portion. We are so grateful for the opportunity to extend the life of this lecture. Within about a month, you'll find the video posted in our Encore archive at bc.edu slash Encore. At the end of this presentation, as I mentioned, there's going to be an opportunity for Q&A. Please feel free to enter a question or comment into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen at any time during the presentation. We will aim to answer as many questions as possible. Finally, we are also able to offer live closed captioning for today's webinar. You will notice a closed captioning button on the bottom of your screen to enable or disable the feature. Many thanks to Julian Morgan, graduate students here at the STM for assisting with the closed captioning for us today. I now invite Father Michael McCarthy, Dean of the School of Theology and Ministry, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Megan. And hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation, Praying with Sweetgrass, Being Naturalized to Place. It's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. First, we have Damian Costello. Dr. Costello received his PhD in Theological Studies from the University of Dayton and specializes in the intersection of Catholic theology, indigenous spiritual traditions, and colonial history. He is an international expert on the life and legacy of Nicholas Black Elk and the author of Black Elk, Colonialism and Lakota Catholicism. Dr. Costello's work is informed by five years of ethnographic work on, on the Navajo Nation. He serves as Director of Postgraduate Studies at NATES, an Indigenous learning community, which is an Indigenous-run ATS-accredited theological graduate school, and is a founding member and the American co-chair of the Indigenous Catholic Research Fellowship. Dr. Costello is an award-winning contributor to U.S. Catholic, America Magazine, and the National Catholic Reporter. And next we have Dr. Daniel Zacharias. Dr. Zacharias is Associate Dean and Associate Professor of New Testament Studies at Acadia Divinity School, a Baptist theological institute located in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, Canada. He teaches in the area of New Testament and Advanced Greek, and also carries administrative responsibilities relating to the Master of Arts in Theology program 
and the Hayward Lectures. He grew up in Winnipeg. After completing his Bachelor of Arts at Providence College, Dr. Zacharias and his wife moved to Nova Scotia to complete his Master of Divinity and Master of Arts at Acadia Divinity School. While working part-time at ADC, Acadia Divinity School, he completed his PhD in New Testament studies through Highland Theological College at the University of Aberdeen. During his time serving at ADC, Dr. Zacharias also completed the process of ordination with the Canadian Baptists of Atlantic Canada and serves regularly in his local church. In addition to his role at ADC, Dr. Z Zacharias is also a faculty member of NATES, an indigenous learning community. We are delighted to have these two distinguished scholars join us virtually for this presentation. Welcome Drs. Costello and Dr. Zacharias. Thank you, Father. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to Praying with Sweetgrass, Becoming Naturalized to, pr to Place. And this beautiful print was made by Brother Mickey McGrath, a friend of uh, the School of Theology and Ministry, presented a, a number of times. And welcome from, the Nate, from Nate's an Indigenous Learning Community. Uh, we are the only Indigenous Theological Graduate School accredited by ATS, um, which means we offer four master's degrees, an MDiv, and now a PhD. And uh, we're, we're very innovative in that we deliver all of our um, programming virtually other than a week, a year when we come together, and uh, we predate COVID in doing this. And we are becoming more and more aware, uh, especially those of us who are not indigenous of the boarding school legend uh, legacy. And so uh, this is our, our elevator pitch here that we are a well-trained, highly dedicated janitorial team cleaning up the messes that have been created uh, when Christians have shown up in indigenous communities all too often. And our work tonight, our talk is gonna be framed by this, this wonderful best-selling book. Hopefully you've come across it. If you haven't, you should. Uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is by Dr. Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer, who brings together uh, indigenous wisdom and Western scientific learning, those two uh, perspectives to think about plants and our relationship to the natural world. And she has an invitation to us non-indigenous people. And she encouraged us to, th to think about reconnecting with the land, a land that uh, is not our ancestral land um, until very re recently, to strive to become naturalized to place. To become naturalized is to live as if your children's future matters, to connect deeply with the land and um, connect with all the beings around us as relatives. And she helps us think through that in very practical ways. And farming is one of those ways. This is a, an example from the Boston area, the Urban Farming Institute. Even in urban areas, you can get your hands in the dirt and you can start to relearn what it is to connect to all the wonderful beings around us. But tonight we're going to mostly focus on healing our spiritual vision as uh, people of the modern world, postmodern world, immigrant people, migrants, non-Indigenous people. Um, there's a lot of healing that we need to go through for this to happen. And Danny and I are going to go through some of the ways that we can start that process. There's, there's four different things we want to uh, focus on here. My colleague Danny is going to focus on the book of Genesis as a way of sort of relearning how to connect to the earth, if you can believe that. And I'll go over very briefly the European connection to sweetgrass. I'll also talk briefly about St. Patrick and Celtic Christianity and I think both of us, uh, mostly in the Q&A, will talk about getting to know your indigenous neighbors, perhaps for the first time. So, Danny, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, like I said, my uh, name is Danny Zacharias, and uh, I'm coming from Wilful, Nova Scotia, known much longer as Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq peoples. And uh, I'm here, here as a guest because uh, my place, my maternal ancestors come from uh, what's often called Treaty 1 territory in Canada, uh, with my ancestors residing in Treaty 1, Treaty 2, Treaty 3, and Treaty 5 territory in what is northern Manitoba, 
uh, although by northern we mean usually just above Winnipeg because uh, it goes quite far north and gets quite remote. I also just want to briefly introduce you to myself as a person, not only where uh, my ancestors reside and where I came from, but also uh, the people that uh, form and shape me now. And uh, right in front of me here uh, is coming a picture of my family. Uh, this is almost two years ago already, uh, so they're already a lot older. Uh, but this is uh, my uh, wife, Maria, who's on the right-hand side, as well as uh, my oldest son in the middle, Lex, who's 19, my next son, Jack, on the far side, my daughter beside me there, Ella Rose, and my youngest, Hudson, who turns seven this weekend and uh, keeps us on our toes. This book is a beautiful book, um, Braiding Sweetgrass. It's, uh, it's, it's a meditation. Um, and the reason that I've been asked by Damien to come and uh, talk to you is because he's a theologian, so he doesn't know how to read the biblical text. He doesn't know what to do with it. And uh, and sometimes uh, I wonder if uh, his Catholicism pushes into that as well. Just joking, just joking. Um, I feel like I'm uh, in a bit of uh, different waters here because I don't know that I've been in a Catholic group before, but um, I'm glad that you've invited me and I appreciate it. Let me talk about uh, a couple of quotations from the book that I really want to launch from and in going into Genesis. So uh, she says here, for tasting its fruit, she was banished from the garden and the gates clang shut behind her. She was made to wander in the wilderness and earn her bread by the sweat of her brow, not by filling her mouth with the sweet, juicy fruits that bend the branches low. In order to eat, she was instructed to subdue the wilderness. Later on, she also says, uh, this is the author, obviously, same species. She's talking about her ancestors and the story of Sky Woman, same species, same earth, different stories, like creation stories everywhere. Cosmologies are a source of identity and orientation to the world. They tell us who we are. We're inevitably shaped by them, no matter how dis distant they may be from our consciousness. One story leads to the generous embrace of the living world, the other to banishment. One, one, one woman is our ancestral gardener, a co-creator of the good green world that would, would be the home of her descendants. The other was an exile, just passing through an alien world on a rough road to her real home in heaven. I have a lot of sympathy for these quotations, but I also wish that I was friends with Robin Wall Kimmerer as a scholar. Um, so I can say, I understand why you're saying that, but I think you're starting from the wrong place, that you're talking about Genesis 3, but you should be talking about Genesis 1 and 2. Because Genesis 1 and 2 are the creation stories. In fact, she talks about original instructions. This is a part of the teachings of indigenous peoples. What are those things that the creator first taught us as peoples that belong to him and come from him and owe uh, honor to? And I want to say that Genesis 1 and 2 is the original instructions, instructions of the Hebrew peoples. And it's something that we are brought into, uh, into the family of faith through the work of Christ. Kimmerer has fallen into the same trap that so many Christians have. They base their anthropology and their theology so often on Genesis 3 rather than Genesis 1 and 2. This results in a deficit-based theology where we think uh, our identity is rooted in sin rather than rooted in the goodness of creator. So in one sense, I completely agree with Kimmerer. If Genesis 3 is functionally your starting place for understanding the creator and his original instructions, this can lead to nothing good. This is what she sees. And I also sympathize and I agree entirely with her diagnosis because practically speaking, this is precisely what modern Christianity, particularly in the last few hundred years, concurrent with colonization and capitalism, this is how it's lived out. The same diagnosis was made by a, a very popular article by Lynn White, uh, The Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis, in which he points to the same thing that she's pointing to here. Original instructions, though, is this concept, this indigenous concept of traditions, again, coming from the creator. And so I'm surprised that she has focused on Genesis 3, even though I understand why. But we need to look to Genesis 1-2. 
And uh, I only have a brief amount of time. I just realized I for, forgot to hit the timer. So uh, Damien, I'm pushing forward as quick as I can. Uh, but if you really need to tell me to be quiet because you need some time, please let me know in some way, maybe through the chat or something. So first off, I want to just look really briefly at Genesis 1. Because Genesis 1, amongst many beautiful things there, uh, we have a series of commands in Genesis. And I'm going to go through a lot of them really quickly here so that we can see. Um, and I won't even necessarily read them. I kind of just want you to see. Let there be light and see what the response is. God does the response to the command, which he also utters. Let there be a dome. The, uh, let there be a dome above the waters. Again, he is the respondent to that. Let the waters under the sky come together into one place so the dry land can appear. He is the respondent to the command. He is the one who then does these things. Let the waters under the sky come together into one place so the dry land can appear. Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate. Oh, sorry, that's a duplicate there. Let the waters swarm with living creatures and let birds fly in the sky. Let the earth produce living creatures according to their kind. Let us make humanity in our image. Again, all of these, God has been the responder to the command. But I skipped one, and hopefully you recognized I skipped one. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you don't have Genesis 1 memorized. Shame on you. But this is the command that I skipped. Let the earth grow plant life. And notice here who responds. It's the earth that produces plant life. How do we take this? Well, the beautiful thing about, again, creation narratives is this is um, showing us that from these seven days, we have co-creation in process here. The land itself responds. The land has agency. The land produces. And so it is in relationship already with creator God. He's in relationship with whatever he creates. And this is what Genesis Chapter 1 is showing us, and here we see that the land is co-creating vegetation. And then we go on, and we see that uh, all of those things that the land has co-created in terms of the vegetation, the results of that vegetation, seeds and fruit, these become our food. Food for beasts and birds, all creatures that move on the ground, everything that has what? The breath of life in it given by God. This is what's given for food to all of us. This speaks to our common creatureliness. There is spirit in all, and the very goodness of God comes in this reciprocity where we are given these gifts, and we're expected to respond, and I'll talk more about that in a second. So I want to, you to imagine a really quick scenario. Let's imagine that we all wake up tomorrow morning after a good night's rest. And we open our window, we look out, and we notice that all the grass is brown. The trees look dead. And every tree outside, as we look closer, we see they're dead, they're withered. Every plant, every blade of grass is gone. We walk outside in disbelief, and we hear no sound. The insects are dead. There are no birds, there's no squirrels. We're panicking. We realize that all biotic life across the globe, land, sea, and sky, is gone with the exceptions of humans. How long would we last? For some, it would be a few weeks. For others, maybe a few months. But inside of a year, we would all be dead. Now, let's imagine a second scenario where the sun rises on a new day, but all the humans are gone. Now, our household pets will notice. Some zoo animals and other injured animals that are under care will notice for sure and may pass away. But how long would the rest of non-human creation last without us? Well, in scenario two, the situation is very different. Non-human creation, animals, birds, bugs, plants, they would not only survive without us, but by all accounts, they would flourish. And so I have to wonder, who is actually caring for who? Because we use the language of creation, care, and stewardship, but in reality, we are the ones that are being taken care of by creator and by the land, even by the animals, the four-footed, the peoples of the sea, the fish who feed us. We are the dependent ones. We are the needy ones, which is exactly what Kimmerer emphasizes in her book as well. 
Genesis 2-4 is the hinge passage between Genesis 1, the first creation story, and Genesis 2, the second creation story. And the hinge verse between these two that transitions one to the other is Genesis 2-4. This is my translation here. This is the family tree of the heaven and the earth when they were created. Now, most of your translations would say uh, record of the genealogies, something like that, something like that, which is not a bad translation, but I like to translate it this way to really emphasize what we often, so often miss, and that is that the word here being used, uh, toledoth in Hebrew, is used, and let me show you uh, a little image here of this word and the ways that it's translated in the NRSV, descendants, generations, genealogies, birth, uh, family, lineage. These are words of familial relations. Toledoth is used when talking about the genealogy, the family line of people. And so for the, for the scriptural author to say, this is the family tree, this is the genealogies of the heaven and the earth, is again pointing to common creatureliness. We are all related. Later on in Genesis 2.6, something we usually know pretty well, hopefully you've heard this, but to emphasize it again, Genesis 2, 6, that the living human, the living being is formed from the living soil. What do I mean by that? Well, it's not, I, we usually translate this as dust, um, but it's not like God got out a broom and dustpan and took uh, very dry stuff and made us. Actually, the word there being used is the topsoil. They know that the life of vegetation sits in the topsoil, the living soil, wriggling with life and bacteria that helps everything to grow. And this is what God gathers into his hands as he creates the soil being the human from the hummus. So how do we capture all of these things? And I've gone through them very quickly, I realize. But what does it mean to say that we are gathered together, that we're made from this land, that this land feeds us and feeds our other common creatures, that we belong to it, that we live on it? Well, I can tell you how Indigenous people respond and they have learned this outside of these scriptures, and Robin Wall Kimmerer, Kimmerer helps us towards this, that she is our mother. This is why we speak this way about creation, because we utterly rely on her. And just like I was formed in my mother's womb and fed by her, nurtured by her, and became uh, came out from her, so too are we created from the land and owe this allegiance and spiritual have this spiritual connection to and so what's our ongoing act of reciprocity then within this community of creation of which we are just a part not sitting above genesis 2 15 says the lord god took the human and settled him in the garden of eden to avod her and to shamar her yes i've used in her here all of your translation would say it but given the fact that Adama soil is a feminine word and that I believe her makes it more relational than it, I've chosen her here. It aligns with my culture and it aligns with the reading that I've just shared with you in Genesis. But what are these two words here, Avad and Shamar? If we look at a variety of translations, we have things like care for and maintain, till and keep, work it, keep it. Farm it, take care of it, work, care, work or watch over. The New Jerusalem Bible, cultivate and take care. A great author who I love uh, named Norman Wiersba, he uses uh, serve and preserve. He says, the times and terms of watering and weeding are set by the plants, not by us. Gardening work, in short, reveals that we are bound by and to the memberships of creation. For a garden sustainably to service our needs, we must first serve and preserve it. I've actually uh, been inclined to and argued for in um, publication to serve and conform to her. And the reason I cho choose this just in brief, is that avod means serve. It's a language of service that's used throughout the Hebrew Bible. And again, it places us in relationship with the land. 
it's not about a resource that we have control over. It's a relationship that we are a part of. And why do I choose conform? Well, shamar, that second Hebrew word, is most often used when it's talking about the law, the Mosaic law that the Israelites were to keep. But when we say keep, we don't mean take care of it like a puppy, keep it well. Actually, the law was supposed to shape their life. They were supposed to walk by it, be bound to it. And so I like the word conform to force us to recognize that the land leads us or ought to lead us, and we ought to be in step. And interestingly enough, the only two, the only times that these two verbs appear together elsewhere in the Bible, it's for temple language or tabernacle language. And some people have said, oh, look, temple language in the creation story. It's like the whole world is a temple. No, 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 no. You got it wrong. It's like the tabernacle and the temple are trying to reconnect us with the sacred relationship between humanity and creation. And so what is the portrait that we see here? And I'm just about done, Damien, so get ready. I think the portrait that we see here is that we, as part of the human community, alongside the ecological community to which we're bound, that's the community of creation. And we sit in this sacred relationship between God, the land, and humanity. And Adam and Eve within Eden was this small picture of that. And then as we move into the Old Testament, we have the same thing, but now it is the nation of Israel and the promised land in relationship with where they are and with their God who loves them and is providing for them. And so what does this mean for you and me? What does it mean for me to live in a land that is not my ancestors, to raise children in Mi'kma'ki? It means that my community, my family, should be connected and reliant upon, recognize the relationship that I'm in with the land that I live in. And I dare say that this is what she is trying to press us into in her book and what we hope you hear. Over to you, Damien. Thank you, Danny. And uh, I know you wanted to talk as long as possible because you know I'm going to talk about Mary and the saints. So if you need to <laughs> plug your ears, go in another room, and nobody tell his Baptist congregation where he is tonight, please. Uh, so what I'm going to do is talk about that 2,000 years that occurred after the biblical tradition, fill in some of the blanks, and how uh, there are indigenous um, connections to Christian tradition, and there are things we can draw upon that Kimmerer talks about and that our uh, Native sisters and brothers here in North America practice. And sweetgrass is one of them. Uh, we didn't get into the story, but if you read Braiding Sweetgrass, you hear about Sky Woman, and how she fell from the sky, and she reached out to the Tree of Life, and she grabbed onto the foliage, and in her hands were all the seeds of this green earth here. And after land was created on the back of turtle, sweetgrass became the first plant and it's called the hair of mother earth. It's also a medicine in the native way, a teacher of healing and compassion. And it's burned ceremonially, which you probably have seen to uh, wash yourself with the sacred smoke to, to purify and, and connect people. Well, you may not know that sweetgrass is also native to Northern Europe. And the scientific name actually means fragrant holy grass. Now, when I first heard this, I was, I was shocked because in all of my botany and science classes uh, growing up, I don't remember much sacred language. I always felt that that was an area where my own faith couldn't go. It was leave that at the door. And of course, Kimmerer talks about that from her indigenous perspective, that indigenous wisdom was also very much excluded. But there's something here that even the scientific community recognizes. And it turns out that indigenous people in Europe also made use of sweetgrass. Sami people are from uh, Northern Scandinavia. They're part of our community at Nates. And... Um, they also use sweetgrass in a ceremonial way. That's a braid of sweetgrass from 1886. And you can see a picture of uh, the Sami way of life very briefly. They're reindeer herders, and there's a teepee-like dwelling that they, they live in. I'm Polish, three-quarters Polish, and so this speaks to me very powerfully. 
uh, it's found in Poland and it has the name bison grass, so brovka. And there's actually a European species of bison that still live. There's a national park in Poland where they are still wild. And it was found as far back as the Neolithic era in archaeological sites. Plug your ears, Danny. Here it comes. It was also called Mary's grass. So it was used in pre-Christian contexts, but with during the Christian era, it was taken into that tradition and used in a liturgical way. And so there's, there's different snippets in the historical record. They're not very deep, but they say things that like they were, it was strewn outside of churches on important feast days. Those are Catholic celebrations, Danny, if that doesn't doesn't make sense. Um, and just like Kimmerer shows that sweetgrass populations thrive close to native communities that use them, there's evidence that sweetgrass spread with ecclesiastical communities. There's a correlation between where they are today and historic church sites. And that's because sweetgrass by and large does not propagate by seed. It has to be transplanted. So it seems as if these communities were using it for us in a sacred way and passing it along as they uh, either when they, they traveled to a new place or to their, their sisters and brothers in faith. And I love this symmetry here. So the story of mother of the hair of mother earth falling with sky woman to the earth. We also know that, or most of us here, maybe not Danny, that Mary was assumed into heaven according to tradition. She, she didn't die. And so maybe there's that circularity there that connects um, this sacred plant, that it came to the earth with the spirits, and that in some way, by calling it Mary's grass, there's this recognition that it also carries us back to the spirits. It bridges the spirits world, spirit world. So this is one question. Is there a way to revive this practice in, in a way that it doesn't appropriate from indigenous people in North America? To sort of revitalize this in Christian contexts, uh, if you're if we're not indigenous, using old world precedences, that's something I'd like to think about in community. Second, um, Christian traditions and stories that contain indigenous teachings still that there are remnants there that we would sometimes never think about, and the most uh, one of the most obvious ones is Saint Patrick and Celtic Christianity. We celebrate that next week. We will get into this very deep. But Ireland is, is unique in that it was never part of the Roman Empire. It was never conquered. And it remained a indigenous culture uh, divided up into 20, about 200 different tribal groups. And it was a rural pastoral economy. Here's some depictions of the traditional dwellings and the um, uh, different regalia that they would wear. Patrick was captured by raiders, and he lived for six years as a something between a slave and an adopted relative. He herded animals until he escaped. He had this big conversion on the land. I think that's really important that his conversion came while he was alone, and he talks about that. He went from a jaded adolescent from a very well-off noble family to um, somebody who lived on the land and who was awakened to the spirit world. Well, anyway, we're going to really breeze over the story. When he returned to Ireland, he lit the Paschal fire in defiance of the tribal chieftain. He sent his warriors after him, and Patrick chanted this song. It's called the Lorica, or the St. Patrick's Breastplate, or often the Deer's Cry. And the story goes that the, the king and his army went rushing by this herd of deer on the hillside that Patrick and his followers had used that song to turn themselves into deer, just like um, the ancient Irish heroes. So in our two minute version of what is a very uh, deep tradition, we'll go, we'll go over the two different parts of, of this song. The first part is the invocation and the binding of the singer to all the powers of creation in an indigenous way in a lot of contexts the first thing you do when you pray is to make relatives with all the spirits and beings around you, to recognize them and ask them to pray with you and to give them their power as you pray to the creator. And this very clearly happens in the beginning of this song, which draws on ancient Irish tradition. This is uh, 
just it's, there's so much uh, that we can look at, but I love this little snippet because it also invokes that power of creation. And finally, there's this uh, spatial radiation of spiritual power. On the right is the Navajo Blessing Way, which is a um, multiple night ceremony that concludes with this invocation of beauty. And the Lorica concludes with this invocation and spatial radiation of the power of Christ all around. I think that uh, when, when the Irish um, took in the Christian message, it, it was very vibrant for two reasons. One, it was not bound by the imperial structures of the church and reinvented itself in a very vibrant evangelical way. I think we can honestly say from from our perspective today, it reinvented Christianity in a very dynamic way. But I think it also carried forward this indig indigenous spirituality in an ex extremely healthy way. That it didn't see Christ bound by our heart, by our small society, or by the human world. It sort of exploded into all the different facets of Irish uh, culture and tradition and spirituality. And if you want to learn more, that's just one place where you can go. Uh, article about the Lorica. So is there a way to re-indigenize this practice? I mean, most of us probably have never heard this. And, uh, you know, obviously St. Patrick's Day is not something that re reflects this. Maybe it could. And finally, real quickly, get to know the indigenous neighbors around you. Many of you, if you're in the Boston area, may not know that one of the oldest reservations in North America is not far from Boston in, in Grafton. I, I was torn about putting this historical marker here because I don't want the impression to be that this, these are people that have faded into the past who no, are, long, are no longer vibrant or present. But this was put up, I think, in the 1930s in recognition of what was already going on. There were powwows that were going on here since uh, the early 1900s, and there was a communal presence without um, without interruption, despite government persecution. And then also the Wampanoag or Wampanoag in the Cape Cod area, they're right next door. So get to know them, get to know about them, get to know how they look at the world and, and put yourself in, in that place. You know, um, one thing we can talk about more is that we always ask indigenous people to enter into our ways of doing things even today, it's also time for us to start doing that as best we can now, entering into indigenous spaces, learning, partnering, and serving in the hopes of maybe doing this different. You know, we have a lot of good examples that we can draw upon. So thank you. And I think Danny and I can take questions. Let's dive right into our question. So um, first question, just coming off your, your remarks, Damien, um, you know, just surprised about St. Patrick being included and just wondering why that's not something that um, they've heard about, you know, in, in a lot of circles, it seems to be more of a Santa Claus figure than anything relatable to indigenous culture. So could you speak a little bit more about that? Well, I think this is probably something that uh, my Baptist colleague and I could agree upon, right? That as the Christian message goes forward, human beings are very good at domesticating it and turning it into something that is very palatable and easy to digest. It takes the challenging things out of it. And I think also as we've become modernized and we've migrated, I mean, I think a big part of this is migration. We've lost connection to our traditions. You know, you can go and read at all the different... Um, books about Celtic spirituality, about how this spirituality has survived in a lot of different embodied ways, maybe not to the degree that it was in the fifth and sixth century, but it remained in Ireland until very relatively recent. So I think it's a combination of um, not taking the faith seriously and losing our connection to the land. And I think these are stories we could jump back into. Danny, I don't know if you have any thoughts um, from your perspective. No, I, I like what you said. I mean, something that uh, you hear if you're around Nate's is uh, everyone's indigenous from somewhere. Um, you have you have 
cultural traditions that uh, you may also have lost um, in your migration, um, and it may be many years ago. Uh, but there is there is that beauty in everyone's culture that you can that you can look for, and sometimes I think people uh, end up reaching into and perhaps appropriating indigenous culture because there's that desire um, without that recognition that I can do the hard work um, from my own tradition, and and I think that that's hard work. But um, I think it can be rewarding because it still lives inside of you. It's it's in your bones. It's in your blood. Building off the appropriation that you just mentioned, um, one of our participants was wondering about, is it appropriation to use the Navajo Blessing Way on prayer walks? Um, not sure if it's from a sacred service. And so the question of in, in prayer, um, how to appropriately use the blessing. You want to go first, Danny? Uh, well, I don't know what she means by sacred service necessarily, so that might be a, a disconnect between our traditions. I would say, in general, uh, I just had two days ago, so I was preaching in a church, and a lady came up to me, and she pulled her hair back, and she was showing me earrings. She's She was a, a non-Indigenous lady, and she said, you know, is it okay for me to wear these? They were beaded, really beautiful earrings. She said they were a gift to me by a Mi'kmaq woman many years ago. Um, and it was a wonderful gift, but I don't know. And I said, if it's a gift, of course you should wear it. You should wear it proudly. Um, and in the same way, if these, uh, you know, if prayers are um, given and uh, given out and uh, are made known, uh, it's for people to to benefit from. Uh, that's different than you making use of it for your own gain. Uh, that's when appropriation really becomes uh, something that is frowned upon uh, because there are people out there who are non-Indigenous who you can hire to come and do smudge ceremonies or sweat lodges, and that's uh, very much frowned upon. Um, that's that's really where appropriation is is relevant. So, Fran, I would say, uh, especially for, you know, for you personally, I assume prayer walks are personal. I don't know if it's something different, but I would say that that's, yeah, that's fine. Just to highlight that, you know, I think if it's for personal devotion, your own personal spirituality, and you're not proclaiming to be an expert, you're not selling it, you're not giving away something you don't really have, it's fine. You know, I think most people want us to grow in wisdom and love and harmony. And that's one way to do it. So keep digging into it, but do it in the way that you're doing it. Well, building off that to literally digging into it, one of our participants was wondering, is it appropriate to grow sweet grass and use it as a blessing for a new land or a home? You take that, Damien. Okay. Um, I mean, I would say that, you know, there are other voices out there, so you should keep listening, but I think it's appropriate to grow. I, I mean, this is a, this is a plant, you know, and we, we grow in relationship to the relationships we form with the other beings around us. And this is a plant um, that comes, I'm assuming you must be of European origin, you're connecting with your ancestors through it. Now, if you're going to go out there and say, I'm going to give a Lakota blessing through this sweet grass and sing a Lakota song, that would be inappropriate unless that was gifted to you. But by all means, get to know these plants. Um, nobody owns species. There might be very small exceptions to that, right? In, um, cultivated plants that have been extremely stressed and they're starting to be regrown in a in a community but i think this is a gift of the creator to everyone another question um an audience member is is looking for your reflections on cultivating relations with the native community and involvement in educational efforts and reform on stories told in books, schools, among people, textbooks, I would imagine as well. Yeah, I assume she's talking about her 
Carol, yeah. Uh, I was talking about grade school um, educational reform. Yeah, I mean, that's really important um, as people are, are um, you know, becoming aware that we're, that it's been the, it's been the colonial uh, legacy that has tended to be the storyteller in the past. And I think part of, again, part of the problem has been education and uh, a big part of the solution uh, in reconciliation will be education as well. And so that's a, that's an important place where uh, schools, and I would say in my area, they, they're doing extre exceptionally well at this, uh, both reforming, you know, choosing better books and, uh, and actually inviting people in from uh, Indigenous and uh, historical communities here. So yes, um, you know, it's both cultivating relations, but it's also, um, it's also doing our part to educate ourselves on uh, the full history and those things that are often missed. And then, you know, and then we're better able and better equipped uh, to participate in that process and challenge schools that aren't, <laughs> that aren't necessarily making those changes that have, you know, a paragraph on the Indigenous people and then 10 on Columbus. Um, you know, those, those things need to be called out and corrected. Danny, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about uh, what you're doing at the Divinity School. Um, you know, I, I had to learn that um, just being Indigenous doesn't mean that you speak for all Indigenous people or that you can, you're qualified to teach the stories of all Indigenous people. So you're forming partnerships um, with the Mi'kmaq people where you are. And how is that going? Yeah, yeah, no, it's very true. And, you know, I try to intentionally, uh, this is, you know, a teaching from uh, someone else in the Nates community of, you know, making sure that just because I, you know, say I have Indigenous heritage, uh, that doesn't mean not only that I speak for all Indigenous people, but that does not mean I'm Indigenous to the place that I live in. Um, I'm not Mi'kmaq. Um, my ancestors' roots are not in this land. And so in the same way that anyone else, uh, almost anyone else in Nova Scotia, so the Mi'kmaq population is around 4%, 4 or 5%, uh, the 95%, uh, we're not Indigenous to this place, even if we're Indigenous from elsewhere <laughs> in Canada. And so, uh, you know, that means that means deferring. Uh, it means, uh, you know, having to, as much as people, you know, out of sincerity want me sometimes to do things within the university or within churches or, you know, a, you know, for instance, I've been asked to do like a, you know, a welcome, you know, on behalf. And I said, well, I can't do a welcome on behalf of the Mi'kmaq nation. I'm not Mi'kmaq. <laughs> um, you know, if we we're in Winnipeg, I could perhaps, you know, maybe do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, just helping people understand that. So, you know, one thing we've had to do, and it's difficult because, uh, the majority of the Mi'kmaq people are further up north in Nova Scotia, but trying to cultivate relationships uh, with local uh, local Mi'kmaq people uh, and the elder that's on the wider university campus. Um, because there's, understandably, uh, this is the case everywhere, um, the church has uh, a legacy of making the good news into bad news. And uh, and it's taken us a long time for them to and and again not to not to uh, be rude to any of you uh, here, but the Mi'kmaq Nation is a Catholic nation. That that was their first encounter with Christianity. Uh, even if they never go to church, they would quite often say they're Catholic. But at the same time, uh, they don't want to go to church, <laughs> um, and they have a very negative view quite often. And and a lot of our relationship building has at the beginning needed to explain the difference between uh, what it means to be Catholic and what it means to be Baptist. And, you know, in it's not because we're being anti-Catholic, it's helping them recognize that you can't assume that I have the same perspective of what you and your ancestors have encountered on the reserve with the local, because there's still a lot of, there's uh, still a lot of, um, not only angst, but I would say just that hostility towards indigenous tradition within the Catholic churches here. Um, so that there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, animosity in some areas. In some, you have, again, very devout 
uh, believers, Catholic believers who are Mi'kmaq and, and don't hold that ill will. But um, that's that's something, you know, that's that extra hurdle of building relationship um, but as you walk together, try to walk together in a good way. Thank you. There's a, a question connected to that about, about repairing relationship between the institutional church and indigenous people, if you want to expand on that. Yeah, well, I mean, I can only speak for Canada, really. It's a bit of a different beast um, in the sense that there has been a, an inter, like a, a national truth and reconciliation commission that, you know, was very intentional by the government. Um, it was entered into by all parties, and that has really spearheaded um, ongoing relationships. And part of that was uh, the work of restitution, reconciliation, and uh and um, trying to repair from those main churches that were uh, involved with the government and the running of the residential schools. And um, so I would say my work uh, has largely been in more in my circles where churches that weren't necessarily involved in the residential school and teaching them that there is still um, that even though we may not as a denomination have been running the schools, uh, we still are treaty people that have not honored the treaties uh, with the indigenous folks and that we have still benefited from land theft and from assimilation. And so uh, a lot of my work has been in helping uh, evangelical, uh, small e evangelical, not US evangelical. I uh, just wanna make those distinctions. Um, because uh, it is quite different up here in Canada, um, but helping those churches see uh, what their role is in the ongoing work of the TRC. And it is difficult work. Um, I mean, and, and it's a new day in post-Christendom um, where you, you know, we were teaching people how to, uh, how to be neighborly, <laughs> how to be respectful, how to go in listening rather than go in shouting and preaching. Um, and it's it's an ongoing work and it's helping people also feel comfortable like there there gets to be a point where people are afraid to talk because they're afraid to say the wrong thing um, but if you build relationships um and and they're genuine then that's when you know uh, love covers up multitude of sins as the bible says so just to offer a few thoughts from from where i am and uh, from a Catholic perspective, I, I think the most important thing is communicating um, a sincere, sincere sort of demonstration that you know this matters, right? And not going overboard about it. You know, I think there's an understandable tendency sometimes to overcompensate and to to maybe be too clingy with Indigenous people and say, "Oh, you know, you've suffered so much," and and words don't always work. It's better to just be present and be, I like to say, authentically vulnerable. It's like so much of indigenous life over the last couple hundred years has been defined by enforced vulnerability. Just go into spaces, be present, be authentically who you are. Don't believe you know all the answers and believe that God is going to, the creator is going to speak to you right? In your heart and through the people you're around. And I would say also to believe that, um, that this relationship is essential for us going to better, going forward in a better way. Like, I think a lot of us think, well, you know, it'd be nice to help Indigenous people or, boy, I'm really special because I want to help Indigenous people. And I think it, we have to get to a point where we believe, no, we're not going to be whole. We're not going to be healthy as people unless we repair this relationship and through it connect to the land and the spirits around us in a complete holistic way. Thank you both. So we just have a few minutes left and I, I'm aware that you both crammed a lot into a short amount of time for each of you. So I'll give you the floor of, of what you would like to, to leave our audience with um, before we wrap up for this evening. I'll just say uh, for 30 seconds, thank you for this opportunity. Um, and I, I want to thank Nates and Danny for, uh, you know, for the community we have here and that, um, that we're doing this work. And 
Nate's is a community that extends an authentic invitation to everyone. And it's that's the most true I've found of any community uh, I've been a part of. So thank you, Danny. And I gave it to you. All right. Get a couple more minutes than you. That's nice. <clears throat> I see a bunch of questions there that we didn't necessarily get to. I thought maybe I could try and do a speed round answering a couple of them in two minutes. But uh, one person asked just about, you know, the language, because I kind of pressed us to think, you know, is there better ways to talk about creation care or environmental stewardship, things like that. And I don't, it's not that I think those are bad, but um, I know, for instance, uh, a theologian uses earth justice um, as an option. Um, and others uh, use the the language of creations creation solidarity um, again to emphasize that relationship of reciprocity as opposed to us being over top of creation. Um, I also saw a question just regarding the First Nations version um, and what my thoughts are on that. Um, I can't speak for Damien. Um, I would say, just to be clear, it is a paraphrase. Um, that's something that, uh, you know, even I've said to the publisher, because I work with that publisher, that it's not a version, it's not a translation from the original uh, languages. It's a, it's a paraphrase by primarily one individual. Um, and it's hard, it's hard for me to answer in some sense, because I'm a biblical scholar, and I usually am reading the, the original language. So, um, it's not something I tend to use, but at the same time, the most important thing really is that there are people that deeply appreciate it um, and that can feel more connected to the scripture in a new way. And for that, I say that's great. Uh, whatever translation or paraphrase is going to do that, uh, I think is is really good. Um, someone asked about the symbol behind my wall. I don't know what which one you're talking about. Uh, if it's this one, uh, this is a drum uh, that I was recently gifted with. Um, from uh, a uh, a Mi'kmaq inmate from a prison uh, over 20 years ago, gave it to a uh, a man who had served faithfully and was receiving an award for his faithful service in prison ministry. And uh, his family, his daughters, gifted it to me uh, just a couple months ago, knowing that I uh, drum and sing and that I would uh, take it along with me and 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 use it. Um, if I assume that that's what they were talking about, uh, if it's the painting above, that's a painting by a local uh, Mi'kmaq artist of uh, of the smudge prayer, which was asked about as well. Is it okay to to uh, be part of that? I would say yes, of course, if you've been invited to, and if you do it respectfully, um, if you've been invited to be part of a circle of smudge, uh, which is uh, a communal prayer. Yes, of course, do it. Do it respectfully, uh, and if you, and if you don't feel comfortable too, that's okay too. <laughs> um, it's okay not to partake as well. All right, thirty seconds left. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Thanks, Damien, for inviting me to be with you in your uh, group, and uh, thanks for everyone who asked questions and and for listening to us. Presenting to us this evening. Uh, thank you to our audience for joining us. We hope that you're able to join us next week for, for Dr. Andrew Davis's lecture as well. We hope that you all have a good evening. Take care. God bless.